Hey everyone, happy new year and welcome back to the Pharmacist Academy where I dive deep into the science behind the medications that shape modern healthcare. Today I'll be breaking down one of the most important drug classes in psychiatry, antipsychotics, specifically the second generation antipsychotics. In this video we will explore how these drugs work, what makes them so effective, indications, side effects, monitoring parameters, and clinical pearls. And don't worry, of course I'll make it easy to understand. So whether you're a healthcare professional, student, or just curious about this topic, this video is for you. Please use just one second to hit the like button and let's get started. Before you watch this video, I highly recommend you watch the previous video on the first generation antipsychotics. Even if you're not interested to know how those drugs work, at least watch the part where I discuss what psych disorders or psychosis is, signs and symptoms, and pathophysiology. This is a video series and it flows like a story, so it will strengthen your understanding. Nonetheless, I will still give a synopsis here before we continue the story. So I may be using the term psychosis and schizophrenia interchangeably in this video, but don't get too caught up with that. Okay, so in general, psychosis causes patients to have abnormal perceptions and thinking and lose touch with reality. How these patients present can be divided into positive and negative symptoms. Example of positive symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, and negative symptoms include anhedonia, so the person may not seem to enjoy all the things they used to enjoy anymore, asociality, so this symptom can include a lack of social drive or an increased desire to spend time alone. As per the dopamine hypothesis, the positive symptoms are due to the hyperactivity of dopamine in the brain, while the negative symptoms are due to the hypoactivity of dopamine in the brain. The first generation antipsychotics work by inhibiting dopamine activity in the brain. This takes care of the positive symptoms by reducing the hyperactivity but it has minimal to no efficacy against negative symptoms. First generation antipsychotics interact with other dopamine receptors in other areas of the brain that's not responsible for the psychosis. This leads to side effects like extrapyramidal symptoms, sedation, weight gain, and dry mouth. The second generation antipsychotics were developed later to possibly address all the deficiencies of the first generation antipsychotics. Now, does the second generation antipsychotics have comparable or better efficacy for positive symptoms? Do they help improve the negative symptoms? Do they have a better toxicity profile? Hmm, let's find out. First, let's learn about the story behind the discovery of the second generation antipsychotics. After the first generation antipsychotics, researchers were looking for alternatives that could be equally effective but with fewer side effects. In the late 1950s, the first ever second generation antipsychotic was synthesized. This was clozapine. Clozapine was initially developed by a team at Sandoz in Switzerland as a potential sedative, but then they did further testing and noticed its antipsychotic effects that were distinct from the first generation antipsychotics. Despite the promising findings, clozapine did not immediately stand out in clinical practice. It was not approved for use in most countries because it was not initially seen as having any significant advantage over existing drugs. Additionally, early clinical trials indicated some severe side effects, notably a granulocytosis, a potentially fatal drop in white blood cell count, which led to clozapine being withdrawn from use in many places by the early 1970s. In the 1980s, a Canadian researcher named Herbert Meltzer and his team who had been studying the neurochemical effects of antipsychotics, began to take a fresh look at clozapine. They found that clozapine had superior efficacy in treating schizophrenia, especially for patients who were resistant to first-generation antipsychotics, also known as typical antipsychotics. And most importantly, it had fewer extrapyramidal side effects. Despite the risk of the agranulocytosis, which required regular blood monitoring to ensure patients and safety, clozapine was approved by the FDA in 1989 for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. This led to further research and the eventual development of other drugs in the class, second-generation antipsychotics, also known as atypical antipsychotics. 
So here are examples of some of the other drugs in the class. I have the generic name and then the brand name in parentheses. These agents have the following indications as listed here for your information and not included, but like I mentioned, treatment resistant schizophrenia, which clozapine is preferred, but we could use other agents as well. Although it's utilized for all of these conditions, I want us to review the mechanism of action of these agents focusing specifically on the treatment of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia patients present with psychotic symptoms or psychosis. So going forward, when I say psychosis, you can just think of schizophrenia. So as mentioned earlier, the dopamine hypothesis addresses what the problem is in patients with psychosis. This hypothesis postulates that the positive symptoms is due to an overactivity of dopamine transmission through the D2 receptor and the mesolimbic pathway. If you're wondering what the mesolimbic pathway is then that means you haven't watched the previous video <laughs> please please do because I don't want to spend too much time covering the same things over again but in a nutshell mesolimbic pathway is one of the several dopaminergic pathways these are the pathways that basically transmit dopamine from the area where it's produced to a different area in the brain to elicit its function now depending on the pathway dopamine will have a different function and that's what these lines or arrows are showing, movement of dopamine from one area to the next. And here are the other pathways and functions on the right. I digress. So for the negative symptoms, the dopamine hypothesis states that it's due to a hypoactivity of dopamine transmission through the D2 receptors in the mesocortical pathway. So we understand what the problem is. Now let's discuss the mechanism of the second generation antipsychotics and how they fix this problem. So just like the first generation antipsychotics, the second generation antipsychotics exert their effects in the mesolimbic pathway where they occupy D2 receptors, preventing dopamine from binding to it, which will lead to a decrease in the positive symptoms. Please note that second generation antipsychotics have a lower affinity for the D2 receptors compared to the first generation antipsychotics, which may reduce the risk of motor side effects like the extrapyramidal symptoms, or EPS. We will discuss more about that later. Second generation antipsychotics, like aripiprazole, act as partial agonist at the D2 receptor at the mesolimbic and the mesocortical pathway. A partial agonist is a type of ligand that activates a receptor, but does not produce the maximum response. This means that the effect is not as strong as a full agonist, even when it binds to all the available receptors. With this type of activity, it modulates dopamine activity rather than just blocking it. This means that it can both block the dopamine when the levels are too high, reducing the positive symptoms, and stimulate the receptor when the dopamine levels are too low, potentially improving the negative symptoms. In the mesocortical pathway, the second generation antipsychotics block serotonin receptors, specifically the 5-HT2A receptor, which plays a crucial role in treating negative symptoms. This action indirectly enhances the release of dopamine within the mesocortical pathway, which is implicated in cognition and emotion regulation. By blocking the 5-HT2A receptors, second-generation antipsychotics indirectly improve dopamine signaling in this area, potentially reducing the negative symptoms. But wait, there's more. Agents like aripiprazole and ziprazidone are partial agonists at the 5-HT1A receptor in the mesocortical pathway. These receptors are involved in regulating mood, anxiety, and emotional responses. Partial agonism at these receptors can lead to anxiolytic effects, which may help with the negative emotional symptoms of schizophrenia, such as depression and hedonia and social withdrawal. But wait, there's more. Neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and glutamate are involved in the mechanism of the second generation antipsychotics. Clozapine and quetiapine stimulate alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. This leads to an increase in the release of norepinephrine, which results in enhanced arousal, energy, and motivation. Now, glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and plays a central role in cognition and neuronal 
communication. There has been growing evidence about glutamate and its involvement in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. This is described in the glutamate hypotheses of schizophrenia. Second generation antipsychotics exert the effects on the glutamate system through various mechanisms. I'm not going into detail about this, but all these mechanisms pretty much help correct the cognitive and negative symptoms. So based on the mechanism of action and what we've discussed so far, it's apparent that the second generation antipsychotics are efficacious for the positive and negative symptoms of psychosis. Now let's assess the side effects and how it compares to the first generation antipsychotics. First, EPS, which is characterized by tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, and tardive dyskinesia, which are involuntary repetitive movements. Now, the second generation antipsychotics have been shown to have a lower risk of EPS compared to the first generation antipsychotic. This is because of their mechanism of action. So from previous video, we know that the first generation antipsychotics can block the D2 receptor in the nigrostriatal pathway. This is what causes the EPS. Now with the second generation antipsychotics, yes, they also block the D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway, but because they have a lower affinity for the D2 receptors, the results and effect is much lower than the first generation antipsychotics. With the additional serotonin blockade, we actually see an increased level of dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathway. So overall leading to lower risk of the EPS compared to the first generation antipsychotics. The EPS can be managed by switching to agents like clozapine and quetiapine, which have the least risk for EPS. The dose may also be reduced and we can also give anticholinergics like benzotropin for Parkinsonism symptoms, which are pretty much a group of movement related symptoms seen in patients with Parkinson disease. So things like tremors, bradykinesia, and muscle rigidity. So in other words, the EPS that these drugs can cause can present like Parkinsonism symptoms. Next, metabolic side effects. This can be weight gain, which is more commonly seen with clozapine, olanzapine, and quetiapine. Patients may also develop type two diabetes, with olanzapine and clozapine and dyslipidemia and cardiovascular diseases. In terms of these side effects, higher rates are seen with the second generation antipsychotics versus the first generation. The reason is because in addition to the dopamine receptors, the second generation antipsychotics block serotonin, like we've discussed, which leads to these side effects. This serotonin blockade is not seen with the first generation antipsychotics. The metabolic symptoms can be managed by switching to agents like aripiprazole, ziprazidone, lorazidone, which have the lowest risk of these metabolic symptoms. Also regular monitoring of the weight, waist circumference, blood glucose, lipid levels are all important for early detection of the metabolic complications. Next, sedation and drowsiness. This is generally seen with both classes, but really depends on which agent from the two classes we use. So for the second generation antipsychotics, it's more common with quetiapine, clozapine, and olanzapine. For the first generation antipsychotics, it's clopromazine and theoritazine. The reason why this side effect occurs in both classes is because of the potent histamine blockade. The high potency of the blockade is the reason this side effect is seen specifically with these agents and not all the drugs in the class. The sedation can be managed by switching to agents like aripiprazole and lorazidone, which are less sedating. Another option is to take these medications at bedtime and adjust the dose to minimize daytime sedation. Next, anticholinergic side effects like dry mouth, constipation, and blurry vision. This is seen with both classes and generally lower incidence with the second generation agents. But within the second generation antipsychotics, the anticholinergic effects are more prominent with clozapine and olanzapine. For the first generations, the anticholinergic is more common with clopromazine and theoritazine. For both classes, the mechanism is due to the blockade of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Next are the cardiovascular effects, which present as orthostatic hypotension, tachycardia, and QT prolongation. The risk is higher with the second generation agents versus the first. 
The cardiovascular effects are more pronounced with agents like clozapine, quetiapine, and olanzapine. For the first generation antipsychotics, it's lopromazine, theoritazine, and haloperidol. The mechanism of the cardiovascular effects is due to alpha-1 adrenergic and potassium channel blockade. So the orthostatic hypotension and the tachycardia is more with the alpha blockade and the QT prolongation is due to the potassium channel blockade. Next, hyperprolactinemia. So prolactin is a hormone that's responsible for lactation, breast tissue development, and milk production. Dopamine normally inhibits the release of prolactin by blocking D2 receptors in the tuber and fundibular pathway, leading to increased prolactin secretion, resulting in milk production or galactorrhea, gynecomastia, or enlargement of male breast tissue and menstrual disturbances. The risk is generally higher with the first generation antipsychotics versus the second generation. But specifically within the class, it's more common with risperidone and paliperidone. And for the first generation antipsychotics, the risk is higher with haloperidol and flufenazine. If prolactin elevation is a concern, consider aripiprazole or quetiapine, which have minimal effects on prolactin levels. Lastly, for the side effects, I wanted to talk about the risk of seizures. This can occur with both classes, but in general, the risk is more prominent with the second generations. But within each class, the risk of seizures varies among the agents. With the second generation antipsychotics, clozapine has the most notable risk. Clozapine is known to lower the seizure threshold, and the risk increases with higher doses, particularly above 600 milligrams per day. But keep in mind that the seizures can occur at any dose. There are other second generation antipsychotics with lower risk than clozapine, more like intermediate risk, so olanzapine and quetiapine. And then we have the agents that have the lowest seizure risk. So examples are here listed for your information. For the first generation antipsychotics, it's more common with clopromazine and theoritazine, and less common with haloperidol and flufenazine. I will not discuss in detail, but in a nutshell, the mechanism associated with the seizure is related to the different neurotransmitters that these agents work on, which will end up altering the delicate balance between the excitatory and inhibitory signals in the brain, making patients more prone to seizures. The management is very simple. We can dose reduce, since it can be dose dependent, switch to a different agent, or add an anticonvulsant. Now the last side effect is the agranulocytosis caused by clozapine, but I'll cover that in the next video, so look out for that. Anyways, before I bring the video to an end, I wanted to go over some clinical pearls of the second generation antipsychotics. Clinical pearls are concise, practical pieces of information. So for patients with poor adherence, long-acting injectable formulations of the second-generation antipsychotics offer a solution to improve compliance and maintain steady blood levels. These agents have different brand names than the oral, and the frequency of administration can range anywhere from two to eight weeks, depending on the agent. Next, drug-drug interactions. These agents have significant drug-drug interactions, so it is important to always check this before initiation. Lastly, tapering and discontinuation. When discontinuing a second-generation antipsychotic, it is important to taper gradually to avoid withdrawal symptoms or rebound effects in schizophrenia or bipolar patients. Do not stop these agents abruptly as this can lead to discontinuation syndrome presenting as irritability and agitation. And that's it for today's video. I hope you found this breakdown of the second generation antipsychotics helpful. If you did, please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more pharmacy insights, and share with anyone who might benefit from this information. And as always, drop any questions or comments you may have down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for watching this video and take care.